Hello, hello. Let me know if there are any issues with the sound or the video. Um, I'm going to get started with the message. I am sorry that I wasn't able to preach on Wednesday and that I had to reschedule, but I um, I had a, I didn't have a message on Wednesday. I studied. I prepared. I don't think it wasn't. I don't think it was because the Lord didn't give me a message. I think it was because I couldn't hear the message that the Lord wanted me to teach because I was in, um, I was emotional that day. I, you know, had something happen. I had an expectation for something and I, um, was I disappointed? I could say I was disappointed. Things didn't go how I expected them to go. Um, and I was all involved in my emotions. So in that state, I really didn't, I, I didn't overcome it. And so I didn't hear what the Lord wanted me to teach that day. Um, so I got on, I talked for maybe about 15 minutes. I didn't really feel that the anointing was there, that the Lord met me there. So I didn't end up preaching, um, which is really the best thing to do in that scenario, because then it would have been me teaching and how I kind of discerned that it, there was no anointing was that there was a strain in my personality when I was speaking. I didn't know what the Lord wanted me to say. I was just kind of talking and talking in the hopes that he would meet me and I would, um, you know, kind of get an idea of where he wanted me to go, but that didn't happen. So I'm happy that I made the attempt to get on to, you know, just to see because that's my job. I'm supposed to just show up. And if the Lord's there, he's there. And if he's not, he's not. And if he's not, then I need to be able to practice discerning when he's not there. So I don't accidentally start teaching when he's not meeting me there. Cause I don't want to be teaching. If it's me teaching, I want it to be anointed and I want him to be teaching through me. So I'm just decided to reschedule for today just to give myself a couple extra days. And I think I have a message, so we'll see how this goes. I I certainly feel in a much better place. Um, and I, I was able to study and I, I believe I have a message, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. But um, part of what I wanted to talk about was expectation um, because I think there is this real misunderstanding in the church, which I, I'm sure I've mentioned it before, is that um, <clears throat> we have expectations of what the Lord is going to do for us. And our prayers are very important um, because we do have spiritual power with our prayers. And it's very important, um, as Pastor told me recently, which I absolutely believe when she said this, that our our prayers are important and we just, it's, it's our responsibility to be careful and we should ask questions. You know, if somebody asks us to pray, we should ask questions and it's okay that we interrogate the person on what exactly they want prayer for. So we're not divesting our spiritual substance into a prayer that the Lord's not honoring and doesn't want, because then that's on us as well. We're contributing to something that's against the Lord's will, essentially. So, um, so we have expectations and we've been told things that, you know, when you pray and you hope, and it's almost so there's such a fine line with the law of attraction where you can choose to manifest things yourself. And it really is using your own spiritual substance that comes from your soul to make things manifest and appear and, and projecting this positivity and expecting something to happen. And then that expectation actually makes it manifest in the physical. So people manifest, you know, jobs that they want, they manifest um, money, they manifest a partner, they manifest a house, they manifest all sorts of things based off of their own will, but sometimes there are people in the church who do the same thing, but they believe that's what the Lord requires of them because that's what they're taught to do. So the expectation when we pray and the expectation of what the Lord has for our life is often much different than 
our own will and desire. So if we want something to happen, um, praying to the Lord to make that thing happen um, is really an exercise of witchcraft and using the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in your prayers in order to achieve something that is your heart's desire. Instead of saying what we should be saying is that, Lord, what do you require of me? And this last week is one of the lessons that I learned is that I'm not yet at a point in my life where I can always say that I say, Lord, what do you require of me? And I don't always do that with a happy heart. But that's the end goal. That's where I would like to be. So it's step by step, exercise by exercise, getting to a place where, okay, if my expectations are over here and what it looks like the Lord's doing for me is over here and they don't match with my expectations, then my emotions get stirred up and I'm bubbling. And it overtakes my intellectual thinking. It takes it overtakes my um, rational mind. And when you get upset in your emotions, it destabilizes you on every level. So our expectations sometimes don't line up with the will that the Lord has for our life. And a result of that is that naturally we get disappointed because we expect the Lord to do such and such and such based off of the letter of the word that suggests that we can just ask for whatever we want, but really ask, you know, ask and it will be done. We ask for it, but it's within the Lord's will. It's in the confines of the Lord's will for our life. So if we want to pursue something, and I can only speak by personal examples that when I got out of college, I wanted to pursue a, a particular career track and I had the doors shut in my face and I tried to do this instead and that didn't work. And I tried to do this instead. I tried to go into the city, into Manhattan to get a job that didn't work. Um, and it wasn't just that it didn't work, but some of the experiences were actually unpleasant experiences. So they soured my experience of trying to look for this and look for that. And then you get to a, a point where you're more likely to ask, Lord, what do you have for me and willing to submit to the option that he has? Because sometimes, a lot of the time, really, that option that he has is not our first choice. So sometimes when we want to pursue something, um, you know, I can't say that, um, you know, I wanted to do this, I wanted to do this, and I I, you know, even if I prayed for it, Lord, you know, I asked for this, I asked for this, but his will was different. So he couldn't give me that. So even if I asked for it, which I really wanted in my heart, so my heart was asking for it, but he didn't give it to me. So the reason he didn't give it to me is because it didn't line up with his will for my life. And this does not just apply to me, but it applies to, to a lot of people who have a relationship with the Lord and his will in your life is starting to make itself more present, more manifested, where you want to seek his counsel, you want to seek his plan for your life. Um, but in doing that, you have to then realize that your ideas and your perceptions for where your life is going will often be detoured to a different avenue. You may end up at the same place, but your avenue to get there may be a little different. So this is what's so dangerous about the teaching of our expectation and our hope in that what we ask for, really, it's not, we're not just, we shouldn't just be asking for things that we want to ask for. And we have legitimate needs. You know, people need housing, people need jobs, they need to support their family, they need food. Um, you know, we have needs and he knows that we have those needs. So. It's not like he's not going to um, put you in a position where you can't feed your family, but 
he'll put you in a position sometimes to give you a just exactly what you need and not a whole lot more because either you're in a position where you're he put you in a position to um you know the external circumstances put pressure on you that is the wine press that's smushing it's what smushes the grapes so it's the press that's pressing and pressing and pressing um and it's a, the point is is that our character is what's supposed to be molded these external factors are just that they're just external factors his goal in our will his will for our life is really to give us his character and into in doing that um he puts us in positions and does things with our life that are more likely to bring good fruit instead of just giving us presents like Santa Claus, like, okay, you want a new house? I'll give you a new house. You want a new car? I'll give you a new car. You want to marry that person? I'll let you marry that person. Because oftentimes that person may not actually be the person for you. It's, um, we're attracted to people based off of um, our soul. So we have soul ties. We have, um, there's, there's another word for it that's eluding me at the moment, but, but we have a natural proclivity to go towards things, um, that are familiar, familiar spirits. That's what it is. So we go towards things that are familiar to us. And sometimes what's familiar to us is not always the best for us because, those familiar spirits come from family line trauma. They come from bad experiences. Um, so whatever's drawing us sometimes to another person that we think we want as a partner is actually what's drawing us is the familiar spirit in our own soul that's drawing us to be attracted to that other person and not necessarily the person that the Lord has for us. You know, because we're attracted to physical things, how the person looks, how much money they make. And especially when you're younger, you're just looking at the external factors. And uh, even in today, especially in today's society where we are very materialistic society, the idea of going for someone based off of their character alone is not really done. It's more about the physical attraction today. And that's what's in the movies. That's what's in society. That's what's in school. Nobody's teaching that good characteristics a good person. That's what you should be looking for. Someone who you can have a peaceful life with instead of an exciting, uh, you know, this person just excites me. I'm so in love, so infatuated. Um, that's not really being talked about that. That's not really love. That's, that's just an infatuation a, f a fleeting attraction. That feeling doesn't last forever. And that really doesn't make a good foundation for a lasting marriage in the Lord. Now, if some people are attracted to each other in the Lord, um, you know, it, some of the external factors might not line up. But a lot of people, they're attracted to other people because of those familiar spirits. So I don't know. I can't remember how I got on this track, but there was a reason for it. But so these essentially these soul ties and the familiar spirits are very important um, when we're coming to the Lord to know that one, they exist and that they have to be dealt with. Um, how did I get on this? I can't remember how I got on this. Oh, expectations. OK, so we have the expectations that, OK, yes, this person I want this, you know, this is the person I want to marry. I'm in love with them. And our expectation is just that the Lord is going to make it happen. Um, instead of our prayer should be for good character, um, we should be praying for um, the Lord to show us our sins. We should be praying for um, the Lord's will in our life, whether we like it or not. So in this past week, that's what happened to me? I was put in a situation where I knew that that's what I should be asking. I should have been saying, Lord, your will, not mine. But I wasn't quite at that place yet. And I confess to the Lord that I wasn't. So a situation presented itself where I thought my expectation 
I thought the Lord was going to be, I expected this, I expected this. And it looked like the Lord's fingerprints were all over it because he does have fingerprints. It looked like he was doing this instead. And I was beyond disappointed. I was, I was beyond. So my emotions got all stirred up and then I couldn't hear Christ in me. And so that is a situation where for lack of a better term, you could say that Christ in me was buried. He was dead for a season. He was sleeping and he needed to be resurrected because um, I was in a, in a place where I couldn't hear him. And I don't like to be in that place. First of all, it doesn't do anything for anybody to be mad at God. It's a very uncomfortable place to be. And the more in the, that I've been in the Lord and the closer that I get to him, I realize that I, when I'm in those situations, I really want to get out of them. I don't like being there. It's a very uncomfortable place because then when I'm in that place, I have also been so trained and tuned into the fact that if I'm in a spiritual place of warfare to reach out for the Lord for help. And then I'm like, well, I can't do that. I can't pray because I'm mad. So it doesn't make any sense. And it actually gets very comical when you think about it, that it's, you can go to the Lord for help, but when you're mad at him, you get mad at him and then you don't pray to the one that can help you get out of that situation. So it's a very strange position to be in. But I think a lot of people in society today are actually in that place where people don't think about praying and and asking the Lord, they don't. And by Lord, I would hope that if anybody hasn't listened to my messages to this point, when I say, Lord, I'm talking about to the father in the name of Jesus, I don't pray to the Holy spirit. I pray to the fa father in the name of Jesus. So when I say, Lord, that's who I'm talking about. So a lot, I, you know, I, I've had conversations with people before and they are in a genuine genuine state of they don't understand this world they don't understand the devastation they don't understand the pain and the hurt and they've been put in situations whether they've been to afghanistan or not they've been places they've seen things they they just don't understand how a god could let things like this happen in this world and and I understand where they're coming from when they say things like that. But what they don't realize is that they're mad at God for not doing something about the state of the world. But they also don't pray to him. They don't seek him. They don't ask for his wisdom. They don't welcome themselves to be vessels of wisdom and understanding and peace and, and good character and good moral opinion and so they're not bringing the right thoughts into the world. They're just reacting to the horrible devastation around them, which is really hard for the mind to comprehend. So many bad things happen to people and children and and people are in pain all over the world. And, and you, if you don't have a relationship with God, you ask the question, well, God, where are you? How can you let this happen? I, this is your creation. And when you don't get the answer, you tend to not believe in God. You tend to be angry at God. You tend to think he's not a benevolent God because there's a misunderstanding. Anytime you have frustration or sometimes anger, it's a lack of understanding. And I get, when I get angry or frustrated, it's often, um, especially this week when I wasn't in the Christ state of mind, I was in an emotional state of mind because I lacked understanding on what was happening. I could not foresee the outcome and I had perceived an outcome. I was expecting um, that it was going to go this other way. That wasn't the way that I wanted because I had attributed um, a plan that I thought the Lord was making happen, but he wasn't actually making it happen. So the plan since my expectations were not met and I felt like the Lord was moving on this other track that I didn't, I didn't want. 
I had already, even though it hadn't happened yet, I had already been like, how could you, how could you do this? This, this, my expectation was totally blown out of the water, you know, and I was so disappointed, but that thing hadn't actually happened yet. So the Lord, when he was able to speak to me, he told me to just relax because, um, I'm going to be the fool that blames God for doing something when it actually hasn't happened yet. And that's not a good place to be. That's a very dangerous place to be. And I think a lot of people in the world blame God for the bad things that happen. One, for the lack of understanding, because they don't understand what this world is, what we're doing here, the reason that it's happening, the enforcer and the spiritual principles of why it's happening. And so the only natural conclusion that the carnal mind comes to is that, well, it must be God's fault. It's his creation. So it, it's his fault for doing this. And they blame the one person that they can actually ask for help. So the carnal mind really twists things. And we often um, attack the one person that, I shouldn't say, and when I say person, I really mean spirit. God is God is not a human person, but we attack the one um, spiritual being that can help us in the situation that we're in, and He can give us the strength to overcome it. So, being mad at God is a very t- terrible place to be. It's a place of hell because your mind is all switched around, and you're mad at the one, the one avenue that you have for relief of your pain but instead you're just lashing out in your pain so it's um there was a i don't know there was a way there was a way i was going with that but i can't remember now so i'm just going to i'm just going to continue i just got totally knocked off the tracks um so anyone If anyone's listening to my message and you are angry at God, I can tell you that the only thing that it does for you is it makes you feel terrible. It drains your energy. It rips anger, rips right through your soul. You're in sin and you need to repent. And the sooner that you do that, the better that you'll feel, even if you don't believe it. Just a general repentance that you know you're in sin and you don't want to feel like this and you just ask for help. And he will help you. Because what's happening is that the spiritual thing that hears from God when you're angry is under the ground. It's buried under Cain and it can't hear God. So now not only are you angry at God in an emotional turmoil, but you've cut off all communication with the spiritual power that can bring you up out of that turmoil and give you peace. So what is expectation? Because the scripture talks about hope and expectation. So hope, I got this from one of pastor's messages. And this is from message 1162, Messiah and Intergenerational Body, um, CCK message 1162, part one. And it says, hope as expectation. Christ is a foundation which an immortal world can be built. That immortal world is a moral world. So Christ is hope. Christ is the hope that we have. And that's what he's our immortal world is built on. It's built on Christ. And what we really have is expectation. So we have certain expectations, but we have expectations in our own personal soul and we have expectations that the Lord has for us. So we're like this and we really need to like line up our expectations to make sure they're on the same track as the expectations of the will of God or else we will get disappointed. And I can guarantee it, anybody going through a spiritual walk and getting closer to the Lord, the deeper that you go in, you can't go through this walk without getting angry at the Lord. You just can't do it. It's not possible because the and the principalities in our land, in our unconscious mind, are directly opposing the force of Christ. They're 
opposing his will. They don't want to submit. So anytime that the light is shined on them where you see your sin, they're not happy to leave. And they're mad at the force that's making them leave. And they are mad at God. And when your personality lines up with them, when you're believing the thoughts that they're giving you and blaming God for things that you think he has done, that he has wronged you, you're then just as guilty because your your personality is not fighting those thoughts that are coming from um, the principalities inside of you, that, that our soul is filled up with all sorts of things and we need to purify our soul. That's the salvation process. It's degrees of salvation. So it's one step at a time. There's no way that you can go through life without getting angry at God at some point. It's normal to do that in the state that we're in, but it's not okay to stay angry at God because it is sin and it doesn't do anything for you because at the end of the day, it's like running into a brick wall. There's nothing you can do about it. If it's the Lord's will of your life, it'll happen one way or the other. The more that you resist, the longer it'll take. And you're just pushing against the pricks. It's better to just submit and take it. And the sooner that the turmoil will resolve itself and you will feel some peace. But it's best to not push against the pricks. So every opportunity that we have is a huge test. Everything. Every door that we could potentially walk through is, is a test. So this particular test that I had this week was to follow those fingerprints of the Lord, whether I liked them or not. So I, I did it anyway. I, I did that right away. And then I got disappointed that I thought, oh, I can't believe this this was the result that that this could actually come to fruition here if I continue down this line. <laughs> and I really wasn't happy. Um, but that's where we all have to get to eventually. That's what the Lord is teaching us to do is to submit to him and to be able to say, Lord, your will not mine, regardless of whether we like it or not. Because I can guarantee most of the time we're probably not going to like it. That he will make us do things that we don't actually want to do. See, there's the difference between teaching, which is theory. And we can listen to all the messages that we want. We can listen to, we can read the letter of the word for 30 years. We can go to church for 30, 40 years. But the actual application of it on our life, those words come to life. And then you realize they're not as rosy as they are when they're written on paper because they're happening to somebody else on paper. And you can be like, that's great. Jesus is great. He died on the cross. He was crucified. Um, the disciples, they were so heroic in what they did. But then it changes when you're also called to live like that and to do something where you're asked to give up something that you really want in life that you think that you can't live without. Whether you think that is a marriage, whether you think it's having kids, whether you think it's moving across country, across the world, a particular career, um, anything that you think that you really want in life that you cannot give up, all of those are possible for the Lord to um, to have a say in. Because the whole scripture, which is, it used to be known in Christianity, was that Christians are martyrs. They, they died for this. There's so many people in, in history that have died for this word. They believed it to that degree that they were willing to die for it even if it wasn't really the, the deep spiritual esoteric understanding of it, 
they died for the letter of the word or their understanding of what they believed Christianity was. And we're supposed to die to our sin. And we're supposed to be complete zealots for the righteousness of God. And what happens with that when it's when the application is now on your personal life, that application is then that you get put in situations physically. You may not get married. You may not have kids. You may have a job you don't want. You may be living in a part of the country you don't want. You may um, not have the friends that you want. You may have to fellowship with people that you don't normally fellowship with. That's the true Christianity. That's the true followers, disciples of Jesus Christ who serve the God of the Bible who lay down their life for righteousness to fulfill his word because we're vessels. So when we're vessels, we go wherever he wants us to go, whether we want to go there or not. There are some people who are missionaries in very nice places. There are some people who are missionaries in very difficult places. I can't imagine that every missionary that's been deployed across the world has been like, oh, yes, I can't wait to go there. But there are people who will go places where they don't want to go. And it's a respectful, it's it's a respectable position to be in. No, people in the Western society don't really think about it that much. But it's more known in the Eastern religions. People in Buddhism and Hinduism live very aesthetic lives. They refrain from a lot of materialistic things. They go, they live in a mountain, they live in a temple. And they have very rigorous training and and it's a very honored position. But here in the West, it's such a materialistic, anti-spiritual, anti-religious society that people who live like that and want to achieve that are not, they're really thought of as weird and they're not as respected as they used to be. So... That's the application of the word on your life. So it gets to be very, very different from just reading it and reading about Jeremiah and reading about the prophets and reading about those who had, you know, got killed in very horrible conditions. I don't want to die in, in one of those conditions. I don't want to give up certain things in this world that I really want to achieve in my personal life. But that's where we are at a crossroads. That's every time we have to make a decision like that, where we have to, we come face to face with, Lord, I see your fingerprints on this situation. I don't really want that situation, but am I going to say, no, I'm not going to do it and rebel? Or am I going to say, Lord, your will, not mine? I'm being very honest. I don't want that, but your will, not mine. I'm willing to do it. Help me overcome. Help me be okay with the situation. Help me um, be strong and do your will that you want to be done. And so that situation, even though the Lord's fingerprints were on it, it was not a permanent situation. I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to happen. This is going to be a long-term uh, thing. And it wasn't at all. The Lord's purpose for it was very simple. It was very, um, quick. And so then when I heard that just the other day, he did speak to me and say, don't put the cart before the horse. It hasn't happened yet. And you will be the foolish one when it's all said and done, where you're blaming God for something that he hasn't actually done. So be careful. Be careful of blaming God for something he hasn't done. Because that's where our carnal mind, our emotions get so upset. And, and it's, you know, anytime anybody's upset, it's, they're always looking, oh, it's your fault. You did this, you did this. And they're not in control of where they lash out at. God has, happens to be on the receiving end of that for a lot of people. But he shouldn't be. Because oftentimes, it's just for a lack of understanding. So my understanding, I can't see the future. I'm just supposed to go step by step 
and obeying the Lord wherever I see a door open, fingerprints. Okay, I think the Lord might be having me go there. I should be going there regardless of whether I want to or not because it's his will on my life, not mine. And if that door opens, it opens. And and eventually I have to trust the Lord that whatever happens, it's for my good. It's for the good of my own spiritual development. It's you know something that he wants to achieve further down the line. It's just not all about me. And that's very difficult. It's very difficult to put that when you're living in that and the letter of the word. This spiritual word becomes more than just letters on the pages. They become carved on your soul. And then you realize that you have to go through things that the disciples went through, that the prophets went through, that Jesus went through, that we are supposed to be sacrificed not physically, we're not supposed to be physically killed, but we're supposed to be in situations where we're supposed to lay down and Christ, we're supposed to, our will is supposed to be crucified. We're supposed to be crucified so that Christ can live through us and his fullness. And he can't do that when we want two different things. When we have a plan for our life in this direction, but the Lord's will in our life goes this direction. The, the set of tracks is going in two very different areas and it, they can't coexist. The tracks have to be going the same way. And it causes us pain when it goes like this. But when we're like this and our will is lined up and we're willing to submit, it's much easier on our personality. So that's where my personality was earlier this week. And so I was in a position where I could not hear Christ giving me the message that he wanted me to teach. But I am an example. So I don't feel it's fair to be going through certain things and not explaining them. Do I want to be? Not really. I really don't want to be putting this out there for everyone to hear. It's not incredibly personal because I'm not giving details, but it's personal enough to where I know other people are going through it. If I'm going through it, we all go through similar things. So if this testimony, if this understanding helps anybody out there, then I have done my job and it hasn't been for not. And it wasn't not for me because I did partially succeed in that I did walk through the door where I saw the fingerprints of the Lord. In my mind, I didn't want to, and I was fighting it in my mind, but I didn't let that stop me from actually doing what the Lord wanted me to do and to investigate that door. So this was similar to an account of Lazarus, which kind of is kind of similar. There's a couple different ways to understand the scripture. But when I was thinking about this message, I thought it's very similar to Lazarus being raised from the dead, because I feel like Christ in me was raised from the dead and sleeping is a form of death. Death can be physical death. It can be spiritual death. There are different interpretations of what it actually means to be dead. But for all intents and purposes, Christ in me was dead because he wasn't operating. So whether he was sleeping, whether he was dead, dead, it doesn't really matter because he wasn't functioning. So for me, he was dead. But Christ rose him, the Lord Jesus Christ, I got strength. And eventually, Christ rose from the dead within me. Something similar to Lazarus. Now, there's a different understandings of what actually happened with Lazarus that have been taught in the ministry. So I'm just going to go with the, the one, the understanding of where Lazarus was sleeping. He was spiritually sleeping and he needed assistance. He needed spiritual assistance because that holy thing that was inside of him was not operating like it should have been it was under his carnality it was under his fallen soul and he was sleeping so he was dead and then Jesus came and raised him from the dead although I will say 
that the other interpretation of it, um, which I read in the notes, which was very helpful. Our database that we have is very helpful because it there's been a lot of messages taught here and a lot of different understandings of scripture because there's different ways to understand these accounts. But one of the other accounts, which I, I will mention just out of curiosity, like just interest, was that Lazarus did physically die, but the holy thing that was inside of him was like attached to him to some degree. So when Jesus came and raised him from the dead, Jesus, that holy thing went back inside of his body and he rose from the dead. So there's two different ways. There's a couple different ways to look at that scripture, which is always very interesting. But when I thought of this personal situation, I did think about Lazarus rising from the dead is that sometimes Christ in us dies and he needs to be risen from the dead. And when he's when he dies, he really just goes under and he can't be heard. So when you can't be heard, like I said, for all intents and purposes, you're, you're dead. You can't you're not functioning. You're not fulfilling your purpose. You don't exist. So I wasn't hearing what the Lord wanted me to teach. So I got assistance. And where did this assistance come from? This is the importance of soul ties. We have ungodly soul ties that affect us. And we have godly soul ties that also strengthen Christ in us. When we have a community, when you're in a community, you're in a church, you're, you have soul ties with the brethren that are in the ministry. And Sometimes you have ungodly soul ties with those in the ministry, but you also have the godly soul ties as well that are hopefully functioning in your churches uh, more than the ungodly soul ties. But I'll leave that up to up to the Lord to figure out which one's operating more. But we do have godly soul ties in that, you know, we dream for each other. We when someone is in spiritual trouble, Christ in us goes out to assist that person. So I believe the collective Christ in the ministry um, comes to my aid anytime I need it. And anytime anybody else is in distress or just confusion going through a hard time, you know, Christ in me and other brethren in the ministry collectively go forward in a rescue mission to help that person, help Christ in them overcome, um, whatever's manifesting in their life at the time. So, The ungodly soul ties, the way that they also affect us is that if there is anger that comes in, it is possible for that soul of the anger person, if we have an ungodly soul tie, to astral project through us and amplify any issue that we have going on at the time. So if we are in this in a personal state where we are irritated um, and we get like a burst of energy from something astral projecting through us. It can amplify that situation to, to, to make us act out in a way that we wouldn't normally act out in. Some people's personalities are much more chill. Some people are cool as cucumbers. Some people are prone to getting angry and have a propensity to lash out more than others. So it just depends on where your personality falls. Um, but some people can be touched and, and quickened to anger and some people it takes a lot more, but those ungodly soul ties, that's why it's so un important for us to break ungodly soul ties because negative things come through there and amplify our situation. And at the end of the day, it's a blessing. It seems strange, but it is a blessing when we have these moments of turmoil because those moments are the exact moments where we can then see our own sin. And we can see like, oh my gosh, Lord, I'm angry at you. I have this sin of anger. This is not good for my soul. This I don't agree with it. And you can actually engage in warfare prayers in the moment, in the midst of it. And that's how you get the new soul of the Lord Jesus Christ when you're actively warring against those thoughts that are in your moment at the time. Because a general prayer, I think Pastor mentioned this recently, which really hit home, it made a lot of sense for me, was that a general prayer, a general confession of sin, it's good, but it's better 
when the sin is active, when you can actually see it pop up in your mind. And you have a scenario where you're pushed to a particular point and then the thought comes out and you know that you're being selfish in that moment. And you can see those thoughts manifesting like, oh, no, that's a selfish thought. I don't agree with that. And then you can engage in warfare at that time to cut it up specifically. If it's just a general prayer, um, you can't see it. And the whole point is you have to see it because once you see the sin, it becomes that much more real for you. It becomes real. It shows us who we really are. It shows us what's living inside of us because you can't really, you can't really understand the gravity of sin until you see what it does to somebody else. And you can't really, you can't really hate it and want to be rid of it unless you can see how detrimental it is and how ugly it is. You know, I've had, I've had thoughts where I'm like, why would I, why would I think of that like that? I don't, I don't agree with that whatsoever. Um, but our unconscious mind is just pushing all these thoughts to our conscious mind just to like throw it at the wall and see what sticks. And then we think that it's our own thoughts, but we don't have to agree with every thought that pops into our head. So the blessing of these situations where we get angry and we get frustrated, it's an opportunity the Lord's giving us an opportunity to see the weaknesses that we have in our personality, that we're squeezed to this degree and then frustration comes out. So we have to deal with that frustration that we're not the perfect little angels that we think we are, that we are actually quite sinful and we need a lot of work and the process of creation is ongoing and I had this thought the other day that it's a very interesting philosophical thought that, you know, the teaching in the church or, you know, once you're saved, you're saved and then you're going to heaven. It's a real misunderstanding of the creation process because someone who says that and who's no longer working on their soul really indirectly believes that the creation is completed at that time. That's what, that's the thought that I had in my mind is that understand that creation is still ongoing. Then you're more likely to really truly believe that you still have an obligation to seek out those destructive thoughts that come through your mind and the sin that manifests through your personality. But if you don't think that's necessary, then you could make the argument that you think that creation is done. Thus, believing that this is what the Lord's end creation would be. Which can't be true because this whole world that we live in definitely can't be the final product. So I just thought that was a very interesting line of thinking um, that I had the other day. Because we still have an obligation to do work. We have a lot of work that we need to do. And it's such a blessing to be put in situations when you think about it. When you think about it from a positive point of view, it's a blessing to be put in situations that put pressure on you. And sometimes I don't think of it like that. Like sometimes I'm like, okay, I need, I need a break. Like I'm very overwhelmed. I can't, if my mind is pushed to a point where I can't think about one more thing, but the Lord doesn't make you go through anything that you can't handle. So it's just a, it's just a, a test that we have to go through. And that the result of the test that I had to go through was to that I know that I'm not at a point yet where I can say, Lord, your will, not mine. That I still want my will. And that's all part of the salvation process is that 
you know where you are at the moment, but you know what your aim is. And our aim is to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, is to manifest and be a perfect vessel for his will. And you can't be a perfect vessel for his will if you're not willing to give up everything. And everything means everything. And when you put that that word everything, if you remove it from the written letter and you carve it into your soul, it becomes much more alive and it becomes terrifying to your own personality. Your, your carnality gets all crazy and manifests because it can't handle, it can't handle the gravity of what everything means. Everything means everything. And how many people are willing to do that? That's why it's not taught in the church. The, the level of expectation that's taught in the church is you ask for, you ask for it and in his name and it will be done. And I think I'm actually going to search for that scripture here. NIV. One bit King James. I'll take the New Living Translation. Matthew 7, 7 to 8. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. However, I believe there is another part to that. I might get the King James. There is a point. I know there is a scripture where it says about his will. And I actually, this wasn't part of my plan to talk about that scripture. So I didn't actually prepare it. But yes, we seek, seek and we'll get it. We seek and we'll get it. It's a misunderstanding of just asking for things like it's a genie in a lamp that Everything that we ask for and receive, it shall be in accordance to his will. In accordance to his will, that's another scripture. 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So our expectations, if we have wrong expectations, if we're thinking that this is how things should be done and the Lord is thinking otherwise, well, then when those things happen otherwise, then we blame the Lord for not making something happen according to our own false expectations. And it just leads to disappointment. It leads to anger at God. And it doesn't, it being angry at God doesn't do anything for you. It just makes you feel miserable. It doesn't accomplish anything. So that I think is the message for today. Let me just check my notes, see if there's anything else that we wanted to say. That we wanted to say here. No, no, it's all about application of the theory. It's more... 
it's more than just reading it in a, in a book and believing that it happened to the prophets and the disciples and Jesus. And it's not for us to apply to our own lives that his will is on our own lives as well, that our lives don't differ much from the disciples. I don't think we'll have to be uh, martyred like them physically, Lord willing. But we'll have to go through things where people might not like us. People might um, talk bad about us. People might have misunderstanding of who we are and what we believe. And they might not like our beliefs. They might say bad things about us. Um, but if that's what happens to us, that compared to what happened to the disciples, that's not a bad way to go. So we have to take it from from theory to application. And the application is that we go through tests and trials throughout our week that test us. And we have to check the open doors. We have to see where the fingerprints of the Lord are and, and check it out, whether we like it or not. If it matches our expectations or not. We have to follow it. And... And be careful to not have expectations that may not line up with the will of God. If our expectations are dashed, then maybe it was because of a lack of our own understanding. And to, we need to get to a place where we're willing to say, whether we mean it or not, but to know that we need to say the words and to know that we should mean it at some point. That our goal is to, to live with the, the understanding, the belief that it's his will, not ours. That to say, to humbly ask, Lord, what do you require of me? That's our end goal. That's our end goal for our life because we are the vessels. And we're supposed to be bringing the Lord's light into this life so they can, into this world, so they can see him for who he really is and not misunderstanding what's going on here. Because the people who don't have understanding see what's happening in the world and they blame God for not taking care of it. People blame God for, you know, why would God let someone come into a school and shoot kids? But at the same time, those kids aren't allowed to pray to God that he's been taken out of the schools. So why is he, why, why is he protecting schools that he's not allowed in? Why is he letting all these bad things happen? But nobody's, nobody's asking for his help. Nobody's trying to, to get his wisdom to to bring his wisdom and understanding to the world to be a vessel for him and do, do what they can to us a better place to actually make it more reflective of him and what he wants for this world. So that's what it's all about. Theory has to move into application. We have to live it. it has to become real. And when it becomes real, it destabilizes us in our emotions and we go from believing and having these wild i shouldn't say wild because they're just like really interesting spiritual experiences just something that gets your spirit so up and you're flying and you're just you feel like there's nothing that could happen to you to, to get you down you're flying in in partis and then your soul comes back down into the real world and now you're back in hell. And to have those experiences, to go up and down like that is very destabilizing to your personality. But those are the opportunities that we have to apply the scripture to our life, to overcome them, so that we can be the perfect vessel that the Lord wants us to be. So on that note, I think I'm going to end the message. I think that's all he has for us today. Um, but Lord willing, I will see you in another couple weeks. I uh, just want to check the date, April 10th. Um, Tony will be with us next week and Pastor on Sunday. And 
Hope you all have a great couple of weeks. God bless.